This podcast episode is brought to you by Alpha Affiliates. Alpha Affiliates are an industry-leading iGaming advertiser with a portfolio of 13 diverse and unique brands for affiliates to promote. Since its launch in 2012, Alpha Affiliates has continued to expand into new markets, working with over 15,000 affiliate partners across 38 countries worldwide. Alpha Affiliates is on a mission to become a world-leading affiliate program. Join their affiliate program and earn up to 50% revenue share commission today. Turn your marketing expertise into profit at alpha-affiliates.com. You're listening to the Affiliate Marketing Podcast, brought to you by affiversemedia.com. The chapter and verse of everything you need to know about running a successful affiliate program for your business. This is a podcast for digital and affiliate marketers, publishers, networks, agencies, and MarTech providers who operate, support, or manage affiliate marketing programs around the globe. If you want to launch, scale, and grow a successful affiliate marketing program, you're in the right place. In this podcast, you'll learn how affiliate and partner marketing is constantly changing and tune in to industry experts who are getting behind our mic to share tactical insights and practical knowledge to help your affiliate program grow. Here, you'll discover what's new and trending in affiliate and performance marketing how to run your affiliate program successfully and gain industry insights from experts and practitioners from around the globe. The truth is, you simply won't find this information anywhere else. Now here's your award-winning affiliate and performance marketing host, an industry veteran, your affiliate marketing guide, and the founder of Affiverse, Leanne Johnston. Welcome to this week's Affiliate Marketing Podcast. And joining me is somebody very special, somebody that I've taken the last year to get to know a little bit better and who I'm very excited to bring onto the podcast this week to talk about a very big topic, which is affiliate fraud. And today we're going to be talking about guarding your affiliate marketing business against anti-fraud and talking about tools and strategies to make sure that you can do that properly. So joining me is Rich Khan, the founder of Aneuro.io. It is such a pleasure to have you on the podcast today, Rich. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. So let's get into it. But before we do, I want you just to introduce yourself and how you got into working fraud and specifically in the affiliate industry. And then just tell us a little bit about Aneuro as well for those of us tuning into the podcast today. Oh, wow. We can be here all day on how I got into this. Yeah. <laughs> it started when I was nine. And the bigger thing of it is my partner and I had started a business 20 years ago, which relied on publishers and affiliates to drive traffic to our network. And the very early days, we saw there was a problem with the traffic coming in to our clients. And it just started to show its ugly head. And I had dealt with fraud before in the past, so I kind of knew what it was. So I figured, you know what, it's 2005 at the time, I think I'm just going to run out, buy a product, bolt it onto my platform and call it a day. And I looked And there was nothing out in the marketplace. In fact, the first commercially available fraud detection solution that you could license didn't come out to, I think it was 2009, eight or nine. So as a developer, I decided I'd write it myself because I was got to solve this problem. Built it, started working, clients were happy. And then 10 years later, I looked up and realized, wow, this is a product that could be a standalone product. And we did some testing, some beta testing, and then we launched in 2017 as a standalone product. So that's been... Even though I've been dealing with fraud most of my career, uh, which is stands almost 30, it's a little over 30 years now, most of it's been in one way or another fighting fraud. Yeah. Okay. So there's nobody better to come on this podcast than you with 30 years experience in fighting fraud. But I want to start by just defining what affiliate fraud really means, because to different people in different parts of the industry, fraud is a very big word. And I'd like you to provide an overview of the landscape of affiliate fraud that you're currently working in and its impact that this has on brands and businesses. Break it down. For anybody that's a layman tuning into this podcast, what do we mean by affiliate fraud? Sure. Yeah, fraud is a big word. If you try advertising fraud on Google, you're going to come up with probably a thousand different types of fraud that exist in the marketplace from real estate fraud to naming for all kinds of stuff. Marriage fraud, I didn't know it was an exist, you know, something that existed, um, but we learned a little bit about that in some of our marketing efforts. So I've been developing digital marketing companies since 19, 1993 on the internet. And over those years, I've come up with two rules. One is people don't read, they skim and scan until they find something that they want to spend some time reading. 
not a, a protocol here. But number two, if you pay somebody to do something, the cheaters will find a way to cheat. So affiliates get paid to do something, drive a lead, drive a visitor, drive interaction, drive you know signups, drive downloads, whatever it is. They're, they're paid to do something. And because they're paid to do something, cheaters will find a way to get around anything that's put out there. And that's why it's one of the highest channels of fraud in the digital marketing space. I think there's eight identified channels, and there's probably more at this point. But for the most part, besides behind programmatic, affiliate fraud is the second highest channel of fraud, averaging 45%. So again, this is just across all affiliates that I've been scanning for the last 20 years. It just tends to be 45%. And some, when I, when I sit down and work with a network, I don't think I've ever caught a network under 15% fraud that was doing affiliate-based marketing. Uh, I've caught as high as 97%. Um, so it really depends. But on, that, on average, we're catching 45% fraud. So what we're talking about is you have affiliates that are, and you set your affiliates up to do something, play this video game, sign up and, and drive product sales. They're going to get stolen credit cards. They're going to use bots. They're going to use human fraud forms. They're going to find a way so they can get paid and get out of the system. And let's face it, affiliates, what do they want? They want to get paid right away. They want to get paid net seven, net three. As quickly as they can get paid, they want to get paid because they know that the issues that they're creating take weeks or months to show up. I actually had a client that was heavily affiliate-based. They were selling airline tickets and it was taking them on average, I shouldn't say on average, it was taking them upwards of nine months to find out that the credit card transaction that they paid out for after week two or they were paid, they were paying out net 15 was fraudulent. So you can have a, a affiliate run fraud for months before they get caught. And that's because it's difficult. You know, the payment periods are long. You know, the activity takes long for the customers to play through, for example. So it's really broad as it is long. You know, some of the things that you've spoken about here, you don't even know that you're being defrauded in an affiliate program until maybe months later because you have to pick up certain kind of data points. You need to start looking at transactional activities that happen after the point of sale. And by then the commissions have been paid and, you know, kind of like a bit of a difficult thing to go back. So what's the most typical kind of fraud that you see in, say, the iGaming industry, for example? I've seen this in gaming. We have a couple of gaming uh, clients, some big ones. And what they do is they'll use bots typically for this activity. They'll log into, they'll create an account, log into the system, play the game up to a certain level, and then take that ID and sell it on the market so people can say, hey, I don't want to skip all the basic levels. I want to start at level two or whatever the scenario is. So the problem is- So falsifying VIPs almost even is a kind of fraud. Yeah, <clears throat> falsifying interactions or falsifying user behavior. And there's two kind of interesting things we see with this. One, first off, that bot that's playing the game to just to get up to a certain level so they can sell the ID, is it being exposed to ads? All of the advertisers are now getting exposed to fraud. So that creates a problem for- the person that we're dealing with, the gaming company. What's interesting is a couple of our uh, team members here are heavy gamers, and one one of them brought it up, and I just thought it was interesting. And he says, oh, no, you, when I'm playing a video game, you can see the bots. I'm like, what do you mean you see the bots? He says, you know, I'll be playing a, a first-party shooter game or something like that, and all of a sudden you'll see a herd of individuals walking together, turning together, doing something together, and you just know they're bots, so you just avoid them. It's like you can visually see them in the game, but yet the company that's hosting the game can't technically pick up on them easily. In fact, one of the companies that we work with, they were saying it would take them upwards of three weeks to identify that those transactions were fraudulent. And then they go back and the damage is already done. Their, their advertisers are already exposed. The account was already sold. All kinds of stuff happens right away. So you know, they'll use a software like us to instantly identify if it's real or fake before they log in to actually prevent that traffic from happening. So in the gaming industry, that's what could happen. And I want to caveat that because it's not always like fraud is, is a, it's kind of like a dirty word. Okay. We know that there is fraud in terms of traffic, bots, everything that you've explained now, but it's not always necessary that an affiliate knows that they've been targeted by a fraudulent gang or cheater gang or whatever it is. So it's very important that we just caveat this conversation for affiliate managers tuning in that what we want to do is make you aware of the different types of fraud that exist in the affiliate industry. Tell you what a big pandemic this is. You're talking about 45% is potentially fraudulent traffic that's coming through that's being paid on CPA or hybrid deals or whatever the case may be. Talk about the impact of that on other digital channels. For example, if you do a deal with an affiliate, they're sending traffic in. That traffic is 
not qualified, not actually lifetime value rich or targeted customer audiences. And then they're also doing remarketing based on all of those customers coming in from that website, they're actually spending their paid media in the wrong places too. So there's a really big and wide effect. It's not just about the affiliate program. It's about making sure that the partners that you're working with are legitimized. And we'll talk about some of the frameworks and things that you can put in place for that too. But also just setting the scene to understand what a big issue fraud is. And I know you see the industry data across the entire industry through your platform. Is this actually a pandemic that we still need to be like highly attuned to and aware of? And do you see it impacting costs in terms of player acquisition? Because I've certainly seen player acquisition costs have increased. They've almost tripled in the last three years, to be honest, in terms of CPA per customer in multiple different industries that we work in. Do you think that's as a result of the fraud because you get to see that kind of breadth and depth? Uh, from what we're seeing, yes. Just to just follow the data. So I look at this for probably 2014, 15, and I have the sheets we can go back and look at. But when fraud was first being tracked, uh, it was mid 2000 teens, right? So you probably like 13, 14, 50, something like that. They were tracking it. Um, different companies were actually putting a valuation on it. And there's a lot of companies that do data like Statistica and a lot of these companies that do reports. You have the AMA, you have the IAB, the MRC. They're all tracking this kind of event. And they try to put a global number on it. And in those first early years where they started tracking it, you were looking at fraud being about five or six billion a year, which is wow. a big number. That is. Right? So it's a lot of money being stolen, and there's obviously a reason behind it. And now what started happening is, and I forget the year, but I think it was 2018, 19, it started to spike and grow exponentially to the point of last year alone tipped over $100 billion in stolen money across all channels, not just wow. affiliates, affiliates, programmatic, all channels across the board. It's been estimated to be over $100 billion. Now, last year was the first year as a global society we tipped over $500 billion. So if you do the simple math, based on those two numbers, you're looking at 20% of every dollar spent on digital marketing was lost to fraud. So these channels are growing. So what we're seeing is percentage of the market spend that's being caught by fraud is growing exponentially. So these guys are getting more and more sophisticated about how they do their attacks. And so it's not just looking at a simple IP address. You know, people look say, hey, oh, I'm going to use an IP scanning tool because they're cheap, they're easy to use. But you know what? walk into a Starbucks, walk into a conference, walk into a business, you all share the same IP address. So if you ban a Starbucks, you're potentially missing out on a lot of good traffic. What about a cell tower? How many people use that same tower in a day that's piped off a single IP address? Again, huge amounts of loss. So IP addresses are not the way to go. Now, sometimes that's all you have to go on. And so you kind of use something like that. But typically what you want to do is you want to be able to touch the visitor collect all kinds of useful information so you can really identify if they're fake or real or fake. Because like you were talking about affiliate managers, you know, they work with a source who's an affiliate. So they're managing that affiliate. And this affiliate is going to be somebody they can meet at a trade show, they go out to lunch with, they have good webinar conversations, they're educating the industry. You know, so you're like, I know this guy's legit. Where does he get his traffic from? That's where the fraud comes from. It's not that person. Perfect example is this. I had a, an affiliate manager call me up, said, okay, I'm using your tool. Everything is looking great, but I've got this source of traffic that scored 40% fraud, and I need to understand more details because I got to have a conversation with them this afternoon, and they were my college roommate. So I had to explain to him, look, I'm going to tell you right now, your college roommate's not screwing you. Yeah. He's getting like somebody might be yeah, somebody might be impacting him. And that's why I wanted to caveat this conversation because fraud is a hot topic. How you approach fraud within your affiliate program is also very important. It can't just be one strike and you're out because half the time the partner doesn't even realize that they are being defrauded. Um, and having tools in place and frameworks in place to actually get an early hit on this as early as possible is kind of the next phase of this podcast that I want to talk to you about. But before I get into that, I actually want to just ask you because I'm interested and we're going to go off topic here a little bit, but what is the most creative piece of affiliate fraud that you've ever un like discovered? And obviously don't give names, but I want to explain how deep fraud can go and how creative these cheaters can be. So in your history of working in fraud, what's the most creative piece of fraud that you've uncovered with a partner or an advertiser that was just so outlandish and out there, but yet it was being done? Have you got an interesting story? Yeah, it's a little older story, so it doesn't give away any secret sauce kind of deal, but it's interesting. And I call it the double click for a tech. So 
what happened was we were tracking uh, an individual fraudster. We knew what our data was suggesting as fraud, but we wanted more detail because we're just data junkies. We want to see it in action. We want to actually catch them in the action because when someone turns around and says, oh, I wasn't doing anything, you want to show it. Irrefutable, yeah. So we were coming along and it was and it was so difficult because trying to catch their advertisement to catch their actual link that's driving they're, they're advertising so many so it took us this took us a couple of weeks to catch and you know, me and one of my partners at the time were sitting down and this was back in the day just to give you to kind of date it a little bit remember when you used to click on things on the internet and you'd hear the little click sound it, they went away with that i don't know why but it, it, they used to have it all the time and it was just satisfying you clicked you heard click you went on it was just kind of cool so some people may not remember that because this goes back a bit um, but anyway so every time you click on something you hear it click so we have all kinds of stuff we have the brightness turned up on the screens the sound turned up we're looking at all this kind of stuff and my partner clicks on something and you hear it click and he goes did you click twice he goes no i didn't what link was that so i look at it i do it i hit the uh, and i search around and i hit the button i hear click i'm like that's not right so we started digging into it and what it was not to drag the story on too long but what it was is uh, if you understand what an iframe is give you a simple term of an iframe it's so you take a sheet of paper and you poke a little hole in it and put another piece of paper behind it that's the iframe these through the page behind it and again this is a good way to describe it so what they were doing was they had a a one by one iframe attached to your mouse so you couldn't see it and as you're moving around, that movement was showing on the previous page because they're moving the iframe around. So the page that they were trying to get the traffic from was seeing natural mouse movement behind the scenes. And then when you press click, it slid the page behind it to a point where that mouse pointer was pointing to what they wanted you to click on. And they were grabbing a click from both the front page of what you were literally trying to click on and a page underneath that you had no idea you were clicking on. So the system would make two click noises. And it was generating all this false interactions on this ad unit behind the scenes that was generating impression, mouse movements, clicks, viewability, all that stuff was there. But at the end of the day, it was like, I looked at it. Once we figured it out, we just looked at each other and go, wow, hats off to this guy. This was incredible how he pulled this off. Well, that's the thing. I mean, cheaters, they are going to cheat and they are going to get creative about it. So you do need to sometimes be in the weeds and have somebody that's looking at that kind of stuff because it's not always going to be surface where you can see clicks, impression, versions, and then go, oh, something's a little bit odd here because the conversion rate's a bit low. But that's probably the first sign that something's not right, but also it does go deeper. So that's a great story. Thanks for sharing that. I'd never heard of that before. But let's talk a little bit about the practicalities now. So we've spoken about uh, the impact of fraud. We've defined what fraud is. We've spoken about how, just how creative it can be and how you really do need to dig into the bull rushes. But what about like, for program managers? What are the key red flags or indicators that suggest potential affiliate fraud that can give you that early green light warning or red light warning that something's not quite right here? And how, what do you do when something like that is identified? Like what's the next step? Okay. So first thing, if you have an affiliate network, that's a red flag. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> yeah. If you're working it's direct, more, it's, yeah. If there's already something happening there. But really, I always tell people, follow the money. Yeah, you, know, you want to be able to track down fraud. It's always follow the money. And if you're starting to see chargebacks on credit cards, you're starting to see uh, if it's lead generation, somebody coming back and saying, hey, I called the leads that you sent me and a couple leads told me that they never filled out the form. That's a problem. It could be high click rates, CTRs on ads, low or unusually low. I usually say if it's outside the realm, it's usually, usually high, unusually low clicks. I spoke to somebody recently and they were telling me how they're used to 15% click on their 15% uh, CTR on their banners. I'm like, 15%. That's over the top. I used to try, I used to do a lot of stuff on the programmatic side where, and I think the average click through ratio might be off a little bit just based on timing, but it used to be like a 0.15% CTR is a typical average click through ratio across the gamut. And I remember early on, I don't know if you remember this, there used to be, it's the first company that came out with interactive banners. First one was called Punch the Monkey. And then you would take a little, you, your mouse would become a little punching glove and you would try to click on them and they generated 5% because they were, you know, it wasn't because of it, but because they were generating clicks. So there was different ways of, you know, keeping tabs on that, but there's stuff you've got to look at. You got to always follow the money. Wherever the affiliate is getting paid, maybe they're getting paid on the impression, maybe they're getting paid on the click, the, the transaction, the sale, something. If you start seeing anomalies on that data, that's usually the first red flag. So how do you start looking into it? 
in this day and age, it's difficult because there are two classifications of fraud. In fact, you know, when they start classifying fraud, they don't call it fraud, they call it IVT, invalid traffic. You can't, there used to be non-human traffic, but human humans are committing fraud too at human fraud farms. So you don't look at it that way. You're looking at what they call invalid traffic. And there's two classifications of invalid traffic. One is called GIVT, general invalid traffic, your basic bots, data center attacks, things like that. And then you have SIVT, which is sophisticated invalid traffic. That's advanced bots, malware, human fraud farms, stuff like that. While there's still stuff you can catch using GIVT detection, which is, hey, look at the IP addresses, look at the user agents. Do you see a pattern? Are there things that are off? Are they coming from data centers? Are they just start looking at that data? Sometimes becomes help. I had, had an individual that popped up and said, hey, I just got you know 30 transactions from the same user agent different IP addresses. And it was an easy find for us of what to look at that data and, and how to interpret that data. But a, the majority of the fraud is literally taking place right now on sophisticated side. I'll give you an example. I think the largest channel from what I've been reading is still programmatic. And there's just stuff like that. And almost every DSP in the world that you go to is using some type of fraud detection on their pre-bid analysis. Pre-bid only gives them one or two data points that they can use for fraud detection. It's got to be quick. So they use what's called a GIBT filter. So most companies, if you ask them for any details on that, they'll tell you they're catching one to 3% fraud. They don't bid on those transactions because they know it's fraud and don't bid on everything else. However, if you use an SIV filter on the display unit itself, you're going to catch an average of 50% fraud. So most fraudsters know that General invalid traffic filters, they'll get away with, they'll catch some of the fraud, but they're not going to catch the lion's share of it. You really need a more sophisticated tool to identify that. So again, testing tools out in the marketplace, running the test to see how much fraud you can catch, and then validating the data. I'm just thinking most affiliate programs have got compliance checking tools because they work in regulated markets. They have to have it as part of the running operating order. But very few clients that I deal with actually have fraud detection tools. And if you're talking about between 20 and 40%, depending on whether you're in a network running direct and you actually know every single one of your partners, that's a huge amount of money on the table that we're not, that we're just ignoring and paying for. And that's the 20p out of every pound or dollar, 20 cents out of every dollar that we're just throwing to waste as a byproduct of the industry, which is really quite mind boggling. When you kind of put it into number terms like this, Fraud needs to be quite high up there on the next to the relationship management, next to the vetting of your partners, next to the administrative running of your, your platform. Fraud needs to be like quite seriously prioritized, I think, especially in this day and age where we're working cross platforms, cross different traffic sources. And we know attribution modeling isn't 100% correct in the affiliate space. Like tracking is kind of broken in the affiliate space. It's actually proving to be quite a big conversation that we're having here, bigger than what I thought it was going to be, to be honest. Well, you're, you're, you're saying the same thing. I've been screaming from the rooftops for a long time that this is something that you at least have to identify. Do you have a problem? And the answer is yes. Everybody does because, again, it's a $100 billion problem. It's no longer the question of if I have fraud. It's a question of how much fraud am I dealing with? And what I tell people is there are tools out in the marketplace that you can use. And what you want to do is test them. Because I'll, I'll ask people this all the time. Use Excel. Almost everybody I talk to uses Excel. When was the last time you confirmed that their math was right? You don't, good right? Point. Because yeah, we live in a society where buy a tool, a piece of software, and you just expect it to do the job, but you don't test it. My space is very different. So my industry is very different because a lot of tools are popping up out of the woodwork. Especially with AI. Yeah. You know. We're putting in substandard product, products in place and then people buy it because they just assume they all work the same and they don't. So what I tell people, if you're going to use a third-party tool, which I do recommend, test it, let it do its marking, and then valid, human validate those transactions. Go through, we even have a document on how to do that, because you want to say, hey, this was marked as fraud, are they right? If this was marked as real, are they right? Because once you decide, I'm going to use this particular solution, or I'm going to use this particular process, you're trusting your entire business on those signals. So and it's going to change. I mean, as you've, you know, the fraud becomes more intelligent as the tools around us evolve and the, act and the actions that we want to track evolve and the depth of data that we can access evolves. So it's something that constantly needs to be plugged into your program and actually tested all the time to make sure that it's accurate. Yeah, I always tell people at least once a year on your radar, you should be sitting down, double checking that 
the tools that you purchased are solving a problem for you. They're doing the job. You've confirmed they're accurate. This way you feel comfortable because the last thing you want to do is in the back of your mind, wow, they're finding 40% fraud. Is that right? Because that's a question I hear all the time. Are you sure? Well, it's 40%. Well, even if you claw back 20%, look, we're never going to get to zero fraud. It's just not possible in the way that the industry works. But if you're clawing back 10% of that fraudulent budget and plugging it into a new niche or a new market, and that brings me on to my next question. From your perspective, you've got a bird's eye view of everything that's fraudulent running through multiple different programs, different brands, different industries. Are the more mature markets the ones that actually have the higher amount of fraud because people have got a little bit more savvy? Or do you still see fraud in emerging markets? And in which case, how do you manage your risk profiling when you're running a global program? Like, wh where do you invest first? So it's weird. Like, the best way to describe that is fraud chases the money. So they look for where the big markets of advertisers are spending their money. So the more traditional countries, UK, US, there, that's where the money is. So they're going to focus. So for example, let's, let's look at spyware, malware. Somebody's going to try to tower at a computer. What are they going to do? They're going to focus on the bigger market. They're going to write software that hits Windows because Windows still dominates the market. So they're going to focus on building that. If they're going to build fraud, I think it's right now, Android's focus on 60% of the market where iPhones have 40% of the market. They're going to write software. They're going to write it for, for the bigger market play first. And then if there's time, go after the other market. So same thing with fraud, ad fraud itself. It, they're going to focus on the bigger, where the money is. But we see it across everything. So the less, you know, if you look at some of the bigger networks, they still have issues with fraud because they're not doing anything to stop it. So if I'm an affiliate that's trying to defraud somebody and I run traffic and it's getting through, crank it up a little more, a little bit more until somebody says something. And then I know, okay, I know where their tolerance is. Because then now it's triggering signals that they can see, and they were spin up a couple and of them. Start back down again. Yeah. And they start it up again. Like them all. Yeah. You could end up with a situation where you're just constantly getting the same kind of traffic and not actually moving away from it because you don't know how to stop it. And that's a big problem. So it's, again, it's a weird situation. It does come from all different areas. Smaller networks are more susceptible because they're typically easy targets because they don't have the resources to spend money on compliance and checking data. But Again, we see it across the board for all companies. It's not, some are affected more than others, but it's not like industry specific. So like billion dollar companies are affected maybe at a lesser degree, but again, they tend to spend more money on programmatic and affiliate based. So they're hitting those higher end market. So again, it really depends on the individual company. Okay, so let's, given the regulatory environment of some of the, well, of this industry, to be honest, because most marketers work across borders, they have to know the rules and regulations across multiple different industries. Can you give us a basic how-to guide to set up a fraud, mon a fraud alerts process in your affiliate program? So what I really want to get to is at the end of this podcast, people go back to their teams and they go, these are the five checkpoints that we need to put in place to make sure that we're trying to get early detection. Even if we don't have the budgets to Im implement tools, what are the five things that we really need to be checking weekly, monthly, quarterly to just keep try and keep ahead of potential fraud that's coming in? Sure. The first and foremost, I tell everybody is vet your affiliates, know who they are, have these conversations that significantly minimizes the amount of fraud coming in the gate right out of the gate. Cause now you know who you're dealing with. I can pick up the phone. I can call you I can get on a video. I can see you face to face. That eliminates a lot of fraud out of the gate. A lot of the more obvious fraud, but then you got the people that we'll talk to. And of course they're getting defrauded and have no idea because they don't have the tool. So talk to your sources of traffic, your affiliates in this case, what tools are they using to minimize fraud? What are they doing to protect you as, as the manager of the program? I've never actually asked an affiliate if they have fraud tools built into their platform, to be honest, but that's a very good question. And that's why you're on this mic. <laughs> Most companies have some, and this is another thing too. Most companies have something in their contract with their affiliates about fraud. I do. Yes. So that's great that it says, Hey, if you detect fraud, but if neither of us are using fraud tools, then how do we know? How do you fraud? detect it? Yeah. Right. So I always uh, be so brazen. How do you keep fraud out of the network? Let them answer that question. And again, they may not have a fraud tool, but they may have a process or they may not have nothing or so use that as additional information. So it's always, so if you've got, you already established an affiliate network and you're reaching out to your affiliates, it's a great question to ask them. Hey, by the way, what do you guys do for fraud? I know fraud's big in the space and big issues. What do you do to protect me in this program? We're very quick to ask that about brand. How are you going to promote my brand? But very lax, I think, on asking about how you're going to protect me from fraud. They should have a reasonable answer. 
something. Again, always, you know, if it's your business, you want to start using some type of fraud detection as soon as you can. But as their transactions start coming through, follow them on. See what's where they're getting paid and start manually checking that. The last thing you want is a client of yours calling you up and saying, hey, I just caused fraud on your network. And you're like, that's the worst thing. You don't want to be reactive. You want to be proactive. You want to be able to identify it ahead of time. So those are the first couple things that I always recommend is just keeping tabs and all that stuff. And if it, I hate to say this, if it looks too good to be true, it probably is. If it's great, yeah, the closing rates are too high. All those things are just signs that there may be something going on that you need to uncover and understand. You need to have solid answer for those because when somebody else catches it downstream from you, they're going to want to ask you those questions. What are you doing to protect me from fraud? What are you doing to stop all this nonsense from happening? And you have to have a good answer for that. So maybe that's something that we can recommend affiliate managers listening to this. You actually build that into your onboarding funnel. Once you've kind of booked your call with your affiliate, you actually ask them to map out the process of how they're going to represent your brand, where they're going to represent your brand, and how they protect themselves from fraud. Because that gives you a really good understanding of whether the partner's mature or immature. And then you can start to put tags into your program to go, this is a new traffic source. It's maybe not a mature affiliate. Let's just keep closer eyes on them. And it gives you time management as well in terms of how you manage your program and all of the partners in it. Because it's easy when you've got 50 partners. When you've got 5,000, it's not that easy. So I think that's really good practical advice. Now, how can we stay ahead of emerging trends? Because we also know that people adapt their fraud activities based on what's coming up. So how do you think the future of fraud looks, basically, if that's even a question? Like, what do you think the next stage of potential fraud could be, especially now with AI? Like, do you think it's just going to keep getting bigger and bigger? Or are there going to be other more creative things that could come in that we need to start looking out for? As long as the gravy train is still paying them, they're going to continue growing it. So here's a bad thing. Everybody's familiar with ChatGPT. Anybody familiar with FraudGPT? Right spots for you. As AI gets more and more mature, these fraudsters are going to, they're already using it. Um, they're using different types of machine learning and AI to try to build stuff to get around the solutions that are in the marketplace because they're getting paid and they don't want to stop. They want that gravy train to keep going. So I see it getting worse. In fact, the reports that I look at and check on and read that are all in the industry are talking about fraud doubling in the next five years. So if that doubling, you're going from 100 billion with a B to 200 billion in the next five years. So if you don't think you're going to be affected by it, the numbers say it's different. You, you are going to be affected by it. So what are you doing today to protect your business long term? So this is something that you should be on right away. Like I said, if you're talking about a company that's got 5,000 affiliates, they can afford to put some tools in place to help them automate that process. If you've got the guy who's just starting out, they've got only a handful, they can go back and call every one of them and say, hey, tell me what you're doing about fraud. There's tools you can do until you're at that point where you can afford a tool. And like I said, you want to make sure if you decide to use a tool to vet it out, make sure you agree with the data. But as you're working, you're build, building your business up to the point where you can get there. There's no reason why you can't get on the phone with every one of your affiliates and talk to them and get a solid answer. If they say fraud, ah, we don't have to worry about that. That's a red flag. It's been an eye opener to have you on this podcast today talking about fraud. We know it's there. We don't maybe sometimes look at how closely it can affect our business. Going into this new year, we are going to have to focus more on cost margin savings. We're coming out of a recession. If, if you can save 20% on the bottom line by not doing anything extra other than just investigating your data a little bit more closely and readjusting your budgets, I think that's a great place to be. Um, it doesn't have to be difficult, like Rich said. It can be as simple as vetting your partners up front and keeping a closer eye on the data for the partners that you maybe think aren't as mature and aren't um, geared up to manage fraud themselves and maybe bucketing them into a group and watching them. And then if you're at that point where you've got a thousand plus affiliates and you can afford the services of a tool, start investigating which tools and testing them, testing which tools work for you. I think that's all really great advice. And it's tactical and actionable. Anybody at whatever stage they are in their affiliate program can implement any of these guidelines that you've given us. So it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. I'm a little bit scared about what you've shared or maybe surprised at what you've shared, but I think everybody listening to this podcast has enough information to get going to go and safeguard their affiliate marketing business and to investigate tools and strategies that they can implement either on small budgets or big budgets that will just help to reduce the kind of pandemic of fraud that we're seeing in this space. So it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on this podcast, Rich. You're always a mountain of information and I really appreciate you like sharing the data and the insights that you've shared with us today and hopefully everybody listening in will find this useful. I appreciate being on today. Enjoy sharing. Thank you. Want to amplify 
Amplify your affiliate program performance? The Amplify Summit is the only affiliate marketing event you need to attend to stay ahead of affiliate trends in 2024. You'll get no sales pitches, just honest advice and answers from industry experts to the questions that you have about affiliate program marketing. Get ready to save the date in your diary as we bring you the biggest and best Amplify Summit yet. Taking place on the 19th and 20th of March, 2024, we'll be giving you the inside scoop on how to amplify your affiliate program and partner performance. Plus, book an on-demand ticket for £49 and you'll gain exclusive access to masterclasses, personal group coaching sessions, and all-important Ask Me Anything sessions with real live industry experts who will show and tell you how to implement new tactics that drive consistent results. Get your ticket to join us at Amplify now. Visit afiversemedia.com and click the button marked Amplify Summit to register. AMP. The Affiliate Manager Performance Program is designed for ambitious affiliate program managers working at brands, agencies, or networks who want to scale their affiliate program and improve their partner performance. We've trained hundreds of affiliate managers from companies like Microsoft, OmniSend, AstroPay, IQ Option, PokerStars, Betson, Oxylabs, ConvertKit, and more. We help them build consistent sales and trusted partnerships. Dedicate just one hour per week over a 12-week period, this affiliate management performance program is unlike any other. Learn proven tactics, tried and tested strategies, and access decades of experience with industry veterans who have launched, scaled, and grown multi-million dollar affiliate programs around the world. Go to afiversemedia.com, hit the training menu, and book your seat on AMP for 2024. That's a wrap for this week's Affiliate Marketing Podcast. If you're loving what we're putting down, why not head over to Apple iTunes and give us a five-star review? Make sure to subscribe to our podcast and our YouTube channel so you never miss another insightful episode or one of our free webinars ever again. Tune in next week for more digital affiliate marketing insights, trends, tips, and content to keep your affiliate and performance marketing fresh and your partners driving consistent sales.